Now, I suppose the commonest charge made against medieval philosophy in general, and I mentioned this in my introduction to this discussion, is the charge that because it was carried out by people who were already committed before they started to the Christian faith, they weren't really, as I put it earlier, pursuing the truth wherever it might lead. They were looking for good reasons for what they already believed. What would your answer be to that accusation? Well, first of all, I'd say that it isn't necessarily... Um a serious charge against a philosopher to say that he's looking for good reasons for what he already believes in. Um, Descartes, for instance, sitting beside his fire wearing his dressing gown, uh, was looking for good reasons for believing that and took a remarkable long time to find them. Uh, Bertrand Russell, who um, accused Aquinas of not being a, a real philosopher because he was looking for reasons for what he already believed, it's extraordinary that that accusation should be made by Russell, who in that book, Principia Mathematica, which I mentioned, takes hundreds of pages to prove to you that two and two make four, which is something he's believed all his life. But more seriously, I think that... Well, the... I, I mean, it's, it's worth interrupting at mm. that point, I think, to, to say quite explicitly that provided it's acknowledged in a fully professional way that the goodness of the reasons is essential, then in a way it doesn't matter what you already believe provided arguments and reasons are subjected without limit to fully rigorous tests. Yes, I think that's right. It doesn't matter what you believe as a philosopher. Uh, the, the philosopher is the person whose task it is to tell good arguments from bad. Yeah. And uh, it doesn't, in a way, matter what the starting or ending point is for a philosopher. It may matter yeah. a lot for other reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed, the distinction that you and I have just made between what you believe and the reasons for which you believe it is something that was very much brought out by Thomas Aquinas, perhaps more than by any other philosopher, because he was committed to a lot of beliefs as a Christian. There were a lot of other things which he believed because he'd read Aristotle. And he's very careful to make a distinction between uh, these things, a distinction which we might say in modern terminology is making a distinction between his job as a theologian and his job as a philosopher. He sees his job as a theologian, above all, to articulate, make explicit, and defend um, the revelation of the history of the world and the future of the world and the salvation of the world contained in the sacred books of Christianity and in the teaching of the church. Um, as a philosopher, uh, his job uh, is to get as far as he can in discovering what kind of place the world is, in what truths we know, necessary truths about the world and about all of thought, uh, just using the unaided reason, not appealing to any alleged divine revelation. He, he makes a very striking point with regard to one specific issue about that, which sticks in my mind. He says at one point that if one considers the philosophical arguments, then there is no uh, uh, compelling reason why one shouldn't believe that the world has always existed. But as a Christian, he doesn't believe that. He believe, as a Christian, he believes that the world had a beginning because God created it. That's right. That's a very good example. There, there were a number of Christian philosophers who thought that you could prove that the world must have had a beginning, essentially because they didn't believe in certain kinds of infinite series. Uh, Aquinas shows the flaws in their arguments and says, no, there's nothing self-contradictory in the idea that the world went on, ha has gone on forever and will go on forever, uh, as indeed Aristotle believed it had. So that Aquinas thinks that with uh, the unaided human reason, um, you cannot prove that the world had a beginning. Equally, you can't prove that it didn't have a beginning, and he objects to Aristotle, who thought it could. Yeah. Aquinas is much more agnostic as a philosopher. He says you can't prove it either way. Um, if you asked him, well, then, why do you believe that the world did have a beginning, he'd say, well, because it says so in the first uh, verse of the book of Genesis in the Bible. But that's something I believe as a Christian, as a theologian, uh, not as a philosopher. You mentioned his two great works at the beginning, the uh, Summa Contra Gentiles and the Summa Theologiae. The Summa Contra Gentiles is meant as a philosophical work, that is, it's uh, directed to people uh, who are not Christians, who may be um, Muslims, who may be Jews, who may be atheists, and it aims to present them with purely uh, human reasons, with reasons that any human being of goodwill can see to be good reasons for believing that there is a God, that the soul is immortal, and so on. 
Uh, the Summa Theologiae is very different. It's addressed to Christians. Uh, it does accept as being good starting points for arguments that it says in the Bible, such and such. Though there's an enormous amount of philosophical uh, reflection contained in this work, even though its title describes it as a book of theology. Let's take now a particular issue about which there was uh, argument uh, throughout the period, the existence of God and whether or not this could be demonstrated. Uh, as you say, uh, it was clear to Christian philosophers that if they were addressing Muslims or Jews, it was no good appealing to the authority of uh, the church or the Bible because Muslims didn't accept that authority, so you were thrown back on argument. And they seem to me to have taken a very professional view of precisely what, what did and what did not constitute uh, a good argument in this field. Now, I suppose the most famous of all arguments for the existence of God in the history of philosophy, at any rate, is the ontological argument. It crops up later in Descartes, in Spinoza, in Leibniz. It's even of interest to a number of philosophers today. And its classic formulation was in the 11th century by St. Anselm. Can you tell us what it was? Yes, but perhaps before I do that, I ought to explain to our listeners what an ontological argument is, what's meant right. by the word ontological. Right. That is that in the uh, Middle Ages and later, there were two different kinds of arguments offered for the existence of God. Uh, one set, of which the best known are the five ways of St. Thomas Aquinas. They take as their starting point some feature of the external world usually some very obvious feature of the external world, as that some things move from place to place, or that uh, some things come into existence and go out of existence. Starting with those and a few universal truths of philosophy, uh, St. Thomas will offer to prove to you that there is something which is recognizable as what all men call God. They are cosmological arguments because they begin from the cosmos. But the ontological argument uh, is a kind of argument which is meant to begin just from the notion of God, from the very conception of God. You don't we have to go outside the realm of ideas to get its starting point. Now, the, as you said, the uh, most uh, well-known formulation of it is that of St. Anselm. Indeed, St. Anselm seems to have been the inventor of the ontological argument, whereas the other arguments are developments of things to be found in Aristotle. Now, Anselm's argument is very ingenious. It takes as its starting point a, a definition of God. He says, well, God is, is something that you can't conceive anything greater than. Now, that seems a pretty harmless definition of God, and uh, somebody who didn't believe in God might, might accept it as a definition. And after all, if you don't believe in something, you need a definition of what it is you don't believe in. And so an atheist might agree, all right, I accept that definition of God as something that you can't conceive anything greater than. Well, then Anselm will say to the atheist, well, let's suppose that, um, that God only exists in the mind and not in reality. Of course, you, you've got to agree that God exists in the mind because you're thinking of him at this very moment, and that's a way of him existing in the mind. But now, if God existed only in the mind and not in reality, then you could conceive of something greater than God because you could conceive of something that was exactly like the God you're just conceiving of only existed in reality as well as in your mind, and that would be greater. Therefore, there would be something greater than God, but God was something that couldn't be, that, that than which you could conceive nothing greater, and you just conceived of something greater than God. That's an absurdity. It's something self-contradictory. What led us to this uh, contradictory result was the assumption that God existed only in the mind and not in reality. Therefore, we have to say that God exists in reality as well. Now, that's the sort of argument that when one hears anyone intelligent nowadays who hears it, is almost bound to think, well, there's something wrong with this. But the disconcerting fact is that when you try to put your finger on precisely what it is that is wrong with it, it's very difficult to do so, isn't it? Yes, I agree with you. I'm one of those who think there's something wrong with that <laughs> argument. But it's not any particularly modern uh, vision of philosophy that makes people think there's something wrong with the argument. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas spends quite a bit of time trying to prove to you that there's something wrong with that argument. He wasn't convinced by it either. But the most interesting thing is that a lot of the great philosophers through history have thought there was something wrong with the argument. They all give different reasons for saying what's wrong with it. And to this day, there isn't any consensus about what is wrong with it. Indeed, there isn't any consensus that there's something wrong with it at all. 
And there is a, recently has grown up in America, uh, a group of philosophers of religion using the latest techniques of uh, mathematicized logic uh, to revamp the argument and to try and present it in a way which is uh, convincing uh, within the background structures of contemporary logic. It would take too long and I would need a blackboard to spell yeah. out how they do it. Yeah. Um, but it's something which, when I was uh, first coming to philosophy, was thought of as a completely dead duck. Yeah. It is now alive uh, and living in Indiana and in California.